Hi, I'm Joel McMahon, the pastor at San Philip United Methodist Church, and I welcome you here on this Memorial Day weekend podcast. Before we go any further, let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Oh God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, oh God, that we find in it uh, those things that we need in our own lives. And Lord, there are some people who are listening today who are experiencing difficulties in their lives. And I pray, O oh God, that you just speak words of encouragement to them today. And also, Lord, there are those who are ill today. Touch them with your healing grace as they open their hearts to you. And uh, we just pray that uh, you would just guide us and direct us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Isaiah, the sixth chapter, we're going to be reading the first through the eighth verses. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. You know, sometimes things can just become overwhelming. It might be just the state of our nation, it might be a personal crisis in your life, maybe your marriage or your family or your finances. Sometimes things can just hit nonstop and all those things can hit at once and throw you into what Martin Luther called the dark night of the soul. I know that can happen because it's happened to me. So what do you do? I think we can learn a lot from what we read of Isaiah's experience with the Lord right here, Isaiah was overwhelmed with the state of leadership in his nation, and he was overwhelmed with the moral decay of the people in his country. Good King Uzziah had died, and the king that was replacing him was just bad, and he was heartsick for his people. And the future of his nation looked hopeless in so many ways. And so, idea, well, Isaiah didn't know what else to do except to pray. Now, he did what we all should do. He sought God the best he could. And that should be always the first thing that we do. And really, most of the time it is because it's ingrained in us to do so. You get in a mess and you, and all of a sudden you're going, Ooh, God, what am I going to do? Now, I read across a picture the other day where this person was pulling a, uh, what looked like it could be deep fried chicken from a, a chicken, fried chicken box, but it was sure shaped like a squirrel. And the caption, you could tell it was just the prayer the person was praying as they were pulling it out. Oh, please be chicken. Please be chicken. You know, uh, we all 
just automatically, when things are distressing to us, turn to the Lord. And we wind up praying, whether we're normally uh, religious prayers or not. I must say, they're never going to be able to ban prayer from school as long as teachers give tests. Sometimes, however, it is the last thing that you can do, because, and it's the last thing you want to do, because you know you got yourself into the mess that you're in, and you're either ashamed, embarrassed, or scared, or some people are just too proud. But you see, none of these should keep you from reaching out to the Lord. If pride has kept you from him, you need to know that it has also been keeping him from helping you. It puts a barrier between you and the Lord. Remember what Jesus said in the, the, at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The poor in spirit are those who are humble, just the opposite of being proud. The apostle Peter tells us in his epistle, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. The story of the prodigal son tells us exactly what we should do with our pride and what the Lord invites you to do with it. And that is to just lay it aside and come home. Your heavenly father has been waiting for you. How about fear, embarrassment, and shame? The cross of Jesus stands as a statement that the Lord has already dealt with anything that we feel God is holding against us. Isaiah later uh, in his uh, book is going to make this statement about what happened during the crucifixion. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. This middle sentence here, or this middle phrase, the chastening for our well-being. Chastening means punishment. Well-being means Shalom is the Hebrew word, peace with God, peace with your surroundings, peace with being who you are. The punishment for our peace fell upon him. The punishment that was due us fell upon God, because, upon Jesus, because he elected to receive it in our place. You see, anything that you feel the Lord might be holding against you, yeah, he is, but he's already taken the punishment upon himself for you if you're willing to receive it. I can attest to that. He told me personally, one time whenever I just cried out when I was at a low point and I didn't even know if there was a God and I cried out, Jesus, help me. All of a sudden, he was right in the room with me, a presence that just emanated love and acceptance. And in, through his presence, he let me know that he had paid the price for everything I had done that was offensive to him. I was forgiven, and so were you if you're willing to receive it. But I had a hard time accepting that. And, so I had all these things that I knew were just unforgivable in my past. And so I was like, but what about, and he said, I took care of it, Joel. But what about, I took care of it, Joel. But what about, I took care of it all. Isaiah knew what to do. He went to the Lord. The Lord says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And so as Isaiah draw, drew near in a very real way, the Lord drew close to Isaiah in a way that Isaiah would never forget. Just the sight of the Lord was enough to take care of all his original concerns, 
all those things that he was so overwhelmed about because all of a sudden it was clear to Isaiah that God was still in control. But in that moment, Isaiah was overwhelmed all over again. Have you ever noticed this in reading this passage? Isaiah comes to the Lord just overwhelmed with what's going on in his country. And then all of a sudden, because of this tremendous change in his worldview and the place that God has in the world and the place that God had in his life and the place where he fit in God's plan and in God's world, whenever he realized all this, he was overwhelmed all over again. The Lord's majesty and holiness seemed to say along with a lot of other things, I don't need any direction or correction, but Isaiah, you need plenty. You see, God's presence revealed that he was a part of the problem. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. All of a sudden, instead of being there, trying to inform God about how bad it was and asking God to do things about all the things that these people were doing wrong, he realized he was praying about himself. He was a part of the problem. David Emery tells a story of baptizing a young father who had a seven-year-old and a five-year-old. And they were close friends of his family and had never been a part of a church. But one Sunday they came to worship and he gave his life to Christ and was baptized. At the end of the service, after everyone else had left, David walked back into the sanctuary to turn off the lights and to lock the doors. And he found this man on the front row with his head in his hands. He sat down next to him only to see that this young father's eyes were red and swollen with tears. What's wrong, he asked. He answered, I just feel this profound sense of the mistakes I've made in my life. I've done some things I'm really ashamed of, and I just need to ask God for forgiveness. When I was a student in college, I played football. I was pretty popular and I used my situation to take advantage of lots and lots of women, and I hurt them again and again and again. Now that I have two little girls, I just pray they don't meet someone like me. I now realize the young women I hurt and the selfish decisions I made for myself, they were somebody else's little girl and I am ashamed. For this young man, the only appropriate words were, woe is me. Now some of you have been there, and when you realize just uh, the holiness of God and the life to which we've been called, and how far short we have fallen of the glory of God and his holiness, and yet there's good news. It's that dark, burden-filled, guilt-laden, and shameful place where God begin, can begin to work in your life because it's in this place where you begin to reach out to God with your whole being. It's in this place where God can reach down into your life, touch you with his grace and forgiveness as he did with Isaiah, and then offer you a new beginning. That's who God is. He is not just holy and far removed. He is also the God of second chances. And if you are at the point right now of woe is me, hear this. God is ready to meet you right where you are to remove all your guiltiness and all your shame. Isaiah went on to the went, Isaiah went to the Lord to pray about the king and the people of Israel. And then in the Lord's presence, his prayer abruptly changes and he sees clearly. 
Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. He realizes that he is just as much a part of the problem uh, that he was concerned about as the people that he was trying to blame for the problem. Do you remember what Jesus said about trying to fix someone else, about getting the speck out of somebody else's eye? He said, first of all, remove the plank from your eye. And this is the next thing that we learned from Isaiah today. Let God help you identify the plank. Don't even try to pinpoint it yourself because you're going to get it wrong because you're going to come at it from a wrong perspective. Again, I know. There was a time in my life when I was uh, just always winding up in bad moods and snapping people, snapping at people, and uh, I blamed them for my bad moods and my ugliness. And then, but God brought, brought me to a place where I realized that I was being mean and ugly and that Christian pastors shouldn't be like that. And so I began to pray about it. Lord, I don't want to be like this. Other people that are in spots like this, they're, they're, they don't handle things like this. And then he showed me what was wrong and he showed me what to do. I had read uh, a Christian counselor talking about when people have uh, uh, just uh, uh, outbursts of anger or moodiness uh, connected with things that shouldn't be, or if their anger was disproportionate to what was going on, that many times this was an indication of a deep sorrow or sadness in their life. They just got a lot of pain on their plate that they haven't dealt with is what it boils down to. And that was me. And I didn't even know it. But there was a deep sorrow and sadness in my life. I asked the Lord to show me. And he did. And the bottom line is I needed to forgive my parents for not being the parents that I wished that they had been. Now, the thing is, it's not that they weren't being the best parents that they knew how to be, but they just weren't being the parents that I'd wished that I'd had. And so I needed to forgive my father and my mother for the way that they did treat me. And then I had to ask God's forgiveness for not honoring them as my father and my mother. And it, you see, it took the Lord's light shining into the depths of my soul to help me see the real problem and what I needed to do about it. And God had the remedy for me. You see, for Isaiah, it was a coal to cleanse. For you, it may be the blood of Christ to forgive and to cleanse. For me at that moment, after already having been forgiven, it was obedience and forgiveness so that I could be set free from my past so I could really live for the Lord in the present and have a life of my own, not dominated by something from my past. You see, in marriage counseling and family counseling, I've discovered that it's nearly always like a tennis match. The couple will come in and one of them is really angry and they're pointing the finger at the other one. And the thing is, that's where we start. But then there's usually a reason why they're angry. And that's where we go next. And then it globs back and forth, just like the ball's in your court. Now the ball's in your court. And we just kind of have to unravel things and come to a place of forgiveness and of a new beginning uh, so that they can start free from the things that have held them in the past. Now, if the other person won't do the, their part, what you can do is what Keith Miller calls tunneling. You work on your stuff. You don't have to worry. Remember, get the, get the plank out of your own eye. You work on your stuff. And as you work on your stuff, you're going to change. You don't have to work on them. And they don't have to cooperate with you. You just work on you. And as you change, the people around you will change. As your actions and reactions in certain settings change, they're going to have to adjust to the new you. 
And it's amazing what can come out of that. You see, changed people change people. Those of you who have gone through divorce, let me tell you what you need to do. It's so important that you do this. Uh, it, uh, hopefully you can do this before you get into another marriage. But even if you had, have, if you haven't done this, you need to do it. Admit your part in your breakup and receive God's forgiveness for it. And then forgive your ex for their part and let him give you a brand new start. Well, that's what Isaiah did for, I mean, that's what God did for Isaiah. He gave him a fresh start. Isaiah went to the temple because he thought God needed to be filled in on what was going on and apparently needed some suggestions. And the Lord revealed to him what was really going on. And then after doing some things for him, cleansing him, helping him to see things differently, he invited him to be a part of the solution. Remember again, Jesus talking about fixing other people, getting the speck out of the eye. He says, first, get the plank out of your own eye. And then, see, there's more to it. Then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You see, Isaiah was converted from wanting things his way to wanting God's will, God's way, and God's timing. And so just to kind of rehash what, what we're learning out of this, the first thing, if things are going bad in your life, turn to God, turn to him. He wants you to. Then have a heart that's open to God. Do you remember the story Jesus told of the Pharisee and the tax collector, how they both came into to the temple to pray? The tax collector stood afar off, with his head bowed, and beating his chest, saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. While the Pharisee, he stood, he prayed there saying, Oh God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I thank you that I'm not like that dreaded tax collector over there and uh, that I do all this stuff. The Pharisee, in his pride and blindness, couldn't even see the Lord. You have to have an humble heart open to the Lord before he can begin to help you. If you are overwhelmed, go to him humbly, understanding that you're at the end of your rope and there's nothing you can do about it except go to him. And you will find a God who's bigger than your problem. Be like the tax collector, not the sinner, or not the Pharisee, so you can go away justified like the tax collector did. Next thing, when you come to pray, let the Holy Spirit order your prayer. You come before him in faith, humbly, trusting in him, and it may seem like you have 25 horrendous things just whirling around in your head. Let the Holy Spirit order the uh, way that you, the sequence that you take these in, because you may have in your own uh, heart and mind determined, this is the important thing. This is what I need to pray about. And all these other things will start trying to just kind of creep in and you find yourself not able to concentrate on that thing. Whatever pops up that's trying to, to come in, a lot of people start thinking, well, that's just the devil trying to distract me. No, it's the, if you're in the Lord's presence, it's the Lord trying to help you to pray. And so I encourage you to just that thing that keeps trying to pop up, set aside the thing that's on your agenda and lift up the thing that the Lord has brought before you. It may seem like it's disconnected, but go ahead and pray that through till you have peace about that. And then as you start to go back to that big thing, probably something else is going to come up. Pray about that. Pray it through till you have peace about that. And I'll tell you, if you will do that, by the time you get through praying through all the things that the Lord's laid before you, when you get to finally, okay, now I can pray about this, you can say, why? This isn't the problem at all. 
I've already prayed through the problem and didn't even realize I was doing it. And then be receptive to what the Lord offers. What Isaiah needed was first and foremost a new way of looking at the world and other people and the Lord and how God fits into the picture. And he realized after he got that straight, he also needed forgiveness and cleansing. After you've done those things, number five, the last thing, get ready for an adventure. Because you see, life in the kingdom of God, when you're really attending to God's will, God's way, and God's timing, is anything but dull. It's the most exciting life that you can live. And the really exciting thing about it is you can go into things fearlessly knowing that you've got the Lord behind you and helping you and guiding you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Some of you even tuned into this because there are things going wrong in your life. And I want to encourage you to do just what uh, I've talked about in this message. Go to the Lord and ask him humbly to help you. The Lord told us, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. But don't go before him with an agenda for fixing the problem. Go before him with the problem. And as Peter says, humble yourself before the Lord and cast all your cares upon him. Let's get started doing that right now. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Lord, there are people right now who have just the, the sea of life is just inundating itself upon them and just covering them with problems and uh, it just seems like they're drowning and there's no way out. And as they just cry out to you from the depths of their being this day, I pray, O oh God, that you will reach down into the depths and that you will just grab their hand and just pull them out and set them on a safe shore in a safe place and then speak to them and help them step by step, moment by moment, day by day with what's before them. I pray that you will just meet them exactly at their point of need and deliver them in Jesus' name. Amen. Now there are some of you, you realize at this point that you have never asked the Lord to forgive you of your sin. And you realize today that your sin is a part of the problem in your life. And you want to start anew and afresh with him. Let's pray about that right now. Lord, as uh, we bow before you at this time, uh, I just pray for those who are reaching out to you, realizing that they have never made a real place in your life uh, or in their life for you. And uh, as they bow before you, I just pray that they would just pray with me. Lord, forgive me for my sin. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I realize now all the different ways that I have hurt other people, and I'm sorry for the trail of pain that I've left on other people and for the offenses that I have committed against you. Thank you for letting me know today that there's a place on the cross for each one of those things that I have done. Forgive me, O oh God. Wash me and cleanse me. And I give my life to you now. The way I've been living, it hasn't been working. And so I wanted to go your way from now on. And so I pray that you will take my life and guide me and direct me from this moment on. In Jesus' name, amen. And for those of you who prayed that prayer, Lord, I just pray that you would honor your word, that if someone would love you, and, uh, uh, and, and, and just receive you, that you would come to them and you and your Father would make your abode with them through the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. Pour your Spirit upon them 
and let them know your living presence in their lives like they've never known it before. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, it's been good being with you today. And if you're ever out in the San Philip area, we ask that you come and join with us uh, in worship. That's at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning. And if not, hope that you'll join us here for this podcast next week. Until then, goodbye and God bless.